Thank you for joining us today. My name is Catherine Price Snedeker. I'm an LCSW and I'm the founder and the uh, CEO of Pink Concussions. And I've partnered today with Nabis and Brain Injury Professional Magazine. And I was the editor of this magazine um, on this issue on women and brain injury. And in this series where we're gonna have casual chats, we will be talking, I'll be talking with people that the professionals that wrote the scientific articles in the magazine. And the idea for this is this is the kind of chat that you would have if you went to a conference and you sat down with one of these experts um, over a salad at the lunch period and just got to talk to them. Who are they? Why are they involved in brain injury? And hear more about their research. I think we have a lot of opportunity to see slide decks and recorded uh, tape, of events and presentations out there in the world, but we really don't have a lot of casual conversations. So I would like to introduce you to today's guest, Tina Master, who I just was trying to figure out how far back in my brain injury world she's been, and she's been there since the beginning, the first big concussions event in 2016. So welcome, Tina, and can you tell us a little bit about how you got to brain injury? Thanks so much, Catherine, for having me. Um, that is a little bit of an interesting story. Um, as I was just saying earlier in a call today at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, I've been there now going on 28 years. Um, so I didn't always start out in sports medicine and, and brain injury. I actually was the uh, vice program director for the residency program. So I trained a lot of pediatricians in my 17 years uh, with the residency program. But then it was interesting because my kids and my patients were growing up and they were participating in sports and they were getting injuries and concussions was one of them. And in particular, I think what really uh, drove my curiosity was that my oldest um, played ice hockey, played it at a kind of a high level. Um, one of his early coaches was Keith Primo when he retired from the Flyers from concussion. And his son actually was a teammate of my son's. And I remember thinking at the time, I can't believe that we still do not know that much about concussion, you know, how to diagnose it, what to do, how to get people better, that someone playing at such a high level as Keith would have to retire from that was a little bit mind boggling to me. And so that really set me on that whole path of trying to just get answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. And then in a somewhat self-serving way also, I felt like if my oldest son was gonna be playing ice hockey for any period of time, he needed to protect that brain of his because I expected him to grow up, get a job, pay taxes and take care of me in my retirement. So uh, that's what ended up happening. I actually then took a sabbatical year, um, did the sports medicine fellowship at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania, um, and then came back to CHOP, um, basically practicing sports medicine, but pr primarily with the clinical and research interest in concussion. And that, that is a little bit of all she wrote, and that's how it all got, got started. And so just for everybody out there, whether you're young or in the middle of your career, or even later, you know, I went back as a 42-year-old fellow. And so, you know, I hadn't done a lot of active learning in a really long time, and it was really a great experience and really tremendous. Oh, that's great. And I do find so often when I talk to you, when you present the, that mixed role of being a clinician and being a parent of very active kids really gives you, you know, a view and a, a balanced view that I think both clinicians and parents take away, uh, you know, it's a much stronger basis from, from which you to speak. Definitely. And I think, you know, obviously um, when you have to go through it yourself, it is a different experience. And so while I've never had any concussions, seeing um, my oldest have a few when he was playing ice hockey, and actually some of them were not from sports, were just from life activities because it happens in life too. It makes you realize what patients and families go through, even in just a small way, which I think is really important to help understand um, how we can try and help them navigate that whole path, because it is a little bit bewildering and it can be very confusing. And like you, um, I entered the, the concussion world through my sons. I have three sons and they were playing youth sports and concussions entered or I knew nothing about. We had one article from US Lacrosse. That's the only reason I even knew about concussions. Um, so my view of concussions was from a parent of boys and that experience. And then over the next couple of years, when I segued to actually work at concussion clinics, 
I kept seeing girls in a very different pattern than boys. And I've told this story before that the girls seemed to show up later. They would show up, you know, I'd get a call from a family of boys saying, you know, we had a concussion last night on the mountain. We went to the ER or it just happened this morning or just literally within 24 hours. And it seemed with the girls, I'd get a call of, well, I think she had a concussion 10 or 15 days ago. She's taken the PSATs and written five papers and now she's a mess and can't even get out of her bed. Or it was three months ago. It was it, it, the parents seemed to come in so much later than the boys. So I actually, as a boy mom, I we had three boys, so I didn't know any other girl moms. I actually thought the girl parents were neglectful that they weren't bringing their girls in. And that's actually what started me looking at the research to see the sex differences. Um, and that's why your study was so fascinating to me. Yeah, so you know, it's really interesting, Catherine, because I'll say when we went into the study, um, we really actually didn't expect to find what we found, which is I think what's wonderful about research and about research that's driven by uh, questions that our patients give us, you know, because really any good question I ever came up with, I got from my patients and pretty much everything that we learned and we do for our kids um, at CHOP, um, we've learned from our, our patients. And so we actually went into it um, uh, kind of interested in vestibular and visual deficits after concussion. Um, we know that those have not really been um, necessarily detected all through the years by folks until more recently, you know, thanks to a lot of folks out there, including our colleagues in Pittsburgh, who've really raised, you know, um, the awareness and the research to show and demonstrate that visual and vestibular issues do occur after concussion for everybody. So we were really interested in that question, particularly, um, you know, the group out in Pittsburgh also had demonstrated that there seemed to be a higher prevalence um, of vestibular symptoms and signs. And that's not necessarily, you know, 100% um, surprising because there appears to be a higher rate of motion sickness tendency in women and females in general. And so we we just wanted to see what it looked like in that's terms of our population and with kids. And that's pre-concussion that, that yes, like before tend yep. to have more headaches. Exactly. In just Absolutely. So even in just um, uh, the ENT um, literature and the vestibular literature outside of concussion, um, motion sickness is a little bit higher um, in women. And so we really approach this um, data expecting to find um, potentially something similar, that there would be you know, um, more vestibular symptoms um, and longer recovery, more deficits, um, and that that would really all trend that way with females, um, longer return to school and return to play. Um, and we did find that. Um, but one thing that we've sort of gotten in the habit of always doing with our research in terms of looking at our patient population um, is try to look at it in terms of when they present because we do have a practice that has an interesting mix. We definitely have um, kids who come to us right away within the first few days of injury that first week um, because of connections either with the, um, their primary care doctor or their school athletic trainer um, or the ER, um, they may get referred to us right away. Um, and then we get kids who may come to us a few weeks later after having, for instance, seen maybe their emergency room, uh, the emergency room or their primary care doctor. And then we certainly get kids who come further out, you know, a month or more because they're just continuing to have issues and they didn't recover. Um, and so they're coming to seek care, um, you know, as a second or a third opinion. And so uh, we have kind of gotten into the habit of trying to see if there's differences in that because um, people who come late may be slightly different from people who come early. And so it was really surprising to us is that, you know, when we looked at everybody, girls did have more vestibular and visual symptoms and they did have um, more deficits, took longer to get better. Um, and so that seemed to be kind of um, really affirming what our hypothesis was. But then when we looked at the group of um, athletes who presented to us within a week versus those who presented to us longer than a week, it was really amazing to us that all those differences were gone. They were eliminated. That essentially girls who got to us within a week recovered at the same rate as boys did. Um, and that was a little bit stunning for us actually. Um, and actually spoke really, I think deeply, um, you know, to many of us on our team. Um, and I really wanna give a shout out to Dr. Natasha Desai, who was a sports medicine fellow with us at the time at CHOP and now is at Columbia doing great sports medicine work there. Um, we all really felt like, you know, this really affirms the fact that this 
this topic is just more complex than, you know, are you male or female? And is that basically what's going to um, you know, determine what your outcome is? It really shows you that, um, you know, there are intrinsic issues that are biologic, you know, that are related to um, sex differences, potentially sex hormones or other, you know, um, sex related characteristics. Uh, but then there's a whole host of extrinsic factors, whether it's, you know, gendered behavior, sociocultural norms, etc. cetera. Um, but even that whole idea, like you described, that girls were presenting somehow later um, and getting to care later made us ask the question, you know, why is that? And can we change that to potentially help improve outcomes? And I, and I think that that stems going back to my work, um, looking at concussions in the high schools. And, you know, it's, I think athletic trainers are amazing and are such a great resource, but how often are the athletic trainers at the girls events? And I know they're on call and it's not meant to you know, they, they can't be everywhere at once, but, you know, who is covering that girls volleyball? And the, the, if I look back over all the interns that we've had, I mean, there's so many volleyball girl concussions where not only were they hurt in the game, but they drove home and they went to three classes, yeah. yep. you know, and then presented so much later that I wonder that if an athletic trainer had been there and they yep. had gotten right away into care, what that difference would be. So that, um, that's a very yeah, that's absolutely the the I think the relevant question for sure. Um, you know, when you have um, athletic trainers is such a valuable resource, um, and yet they can't be everywhere at all times. And there's usually decisions that are made to deploy them at um, what are essentially perceived as higher risk um, sports, such as football, ice hockey, lacrosse, um, etc. Um, it does raise the question that if you were able to have access um, quickly and early like that, would it make a difference? And we have a little bit of a hint of that because um, of some work that came again out of Pittsburgh, but also um, Dr. Christine Ball, who's now out at Colorado. Um, big have fan, looked, big fan exactly, of Christine. Exactly. The fact that um, uh, both groups have essentially found that um, uh, early access um, for both boys and girls um, to specialized um, sports medical care um, uh, had an effect on improving outcomes. Um, that's from the Pittsburgh group. Um, and then in Christine's work, which is really outstanding, uh, looking at the collegiate level, um, if you had um, greater access to a sports medicine um, model um, where you got care um, early, you have better outcomes, fewer injuries. Um, and so I think from that standpoint, um, there is definitely um, room for progress in terms of resource allocation and identification. And it makes sense too, because you know it's always been pretty consistently reported that um, females report higher symptoms, you know, and that is correlated with longer recovery. Um, but it is interesting that um, again, it, it gives you the sense that we are not, um, just a product of our genes. You know, genetics is not our destiny. Um, you know, from that standpoint, if you are, you know, genetically um, female, it doesn't mean, you know, that slam dunk, you're gonna have a long recovery from a concussion by any means. Um, and there are ways that we can um, actually address that both from a prevention or an early intervention kind of way that I think we need to understand better. So instead of just saying, you know, heck, sorry for you, you're a girl, um, you're gonna have a bad outcome, um, which is not the case. Um, we can actually actively seek to find ways where we can, you know, so to speak, level the playing field. Right, right. No, definitely. And I think that's one of the things with that pink concussions is always focused on is the, the differences, not whether, you know, we're looking just for deficits, but the advantages to being female and whether you have a more intact support group that's willing to talk about health issues as opposed to a male group. So, you know, I think there are advantages both ways. I wanted to ask, you know, what you have seen in the hockey arena um, in youth sports and the changes in the last 10 years, um, and then um, segue to your work with this, uh, with vision. Yeah, no, I do think that um, there's a lot that we can learn from each of the different sports in terms of the different changes that have occurred, whether it was related to concussion directly or whether it was related to other developmental issues. So I think actually early on, um, USA Hockey ended up raising their checking age, um, similar to what um, Hockey Canada did in terms of raising the checking age. Um, some really fantastic work from Karen, Carolyn Emery out in Calgary 
has Another demonstrated person. that um, reducing um, that increasing the checking age does reduce all injuries, including concussion. Um, and from that standpoint, I think that that makes a difference in terms of you know what happens with regard to um, injuries that you're sustaining at that young age. You know, is checking uh, an essential sport uh, skill in the sport that you need to learn early on? The same question that obviously U.S. Soccer um, dealt with in terms of um, examining heading and then you know a number of years later raising the heading age. So I think from that standpoint, um, you know, with all those aspects, there doesn't appear to be any um, deck rent or loss of skill from raising the checking age. Um, you know, my oldest son also had the real privilege of being coached by Darian Hatcher when he retired from the Flyers um, uh, because his son was the same age. And so from that standpoint, you know, Darian used to say, well, we don't really need to teach the boys how to check necessarily. It kind of comes naturally. Um, and so I think there, there's a lot of, you know, as a little bit tongue in cheek, but I think that there's a lot to be said in terms of examining what are the rules of play that we can uh, modify in order to improve safety and still have really great um, skill development and outcomes in terms of athlete development? Um, and what can we do in, in terms of making sure that practice and training habits um, and procedures, you know, again, um, with football, um, limiting contact during practice, you know, do you want your star player to get injured in practice when really what you want them to do is be available for the game, you know? And so again, um, those are all questions that I think we need to ask in youth sports. You know, we're really trying to develop skills um, in our athletes our young athletes and we want them to um, develop a love for the sport and hopefully play the sport for a lifetime you know not necessarily professionally but for a lifetime and so how can we look at making those modifications in rules that can increase safety because we've learned from you know epidemiological studies that we can uh, make a difference and and really maintain still the spirit of the sport and um, having uh, helping kids to just learn to love to play them for a lifetime. And I think it'll be interesting that COVID has, has put a check essentially on, you know, the, uh, my kid is not really fulfilled as a player unless we, you know, fly somewhere or go six states away for, an, you know, an international tour uh, tr tournament. I'm hoping that this kind of brings everybody back to more local play to um, less emphasis on some of the competitive nature and back to more of the spirit of, of the fun and camaraderie. Um, now with youth sports, if we get better at identifying them and we get the patients, can you talk a little bit about when patients, male and female come into your clinic and what are those early interventions that you work with? Absolutely. That's a great question. And I think that that's one thing we didn't probably highlight as much as we could have in the paper. Um, you know, uh, things have really shifted in concussion care over the last decade, where it's moved from a mostly passive approach in terms of watching and waiting and just expecting kids to get better um, as we watch and wait um, to a much more active approach and active intervention and rehab approach that includes um, interventions that are visual and vestibular in nature, as well as um, aerobic exercise with all the great work that John Letty has done in Buffalo. And one of the things that we actually realized um, in terms of the um, uh, cohort when we split it between the kids who came earlier within a week versus the kids that came later was that girls were not really exercising before they came to us. And so if they came to us earlier, they actually started exercising earlier. Um, and there's some really good work that John um, has published out of Buffalo that indicates that um, that aerobic exercise may have a bigger impact in terms of improving outcomes for girls than boys even, that they may suffer more if we withhold um, the appropriate levels of exercise in that um, early time frame and hold them out too long, especially athletes. When you think about athletes and exercise, exercise is like a medication for them. If we withdraw exercise um, too quickly um, and completely and for a prolonged period of time, it may have a negative effect like withdrawing from a drug. And so I think from that standpoint, that was one thing that I think may have made a, a big difference. And that's something that I know Anthony Contos and his group in Pittsburgh felt was the case in their cohort when both boys and girls, men and women, had improved outcomes when they uh, were presenting earlier to sports medicine care was that implementation of an active recovery um, approach. And so that's really, I think, what we would probably want to get out there is that you want to be supervised with that because, again, you know, you don't want to overdo it early either as well. So it's not just kind of go out there and do whatever you want like the old days, but um, having someone who can help you through that. And there's an article, John Letty's article uh, with Barry Willer is here. Um, if I can drag him on, um, John doesn't love my casual conversation um, format. 
Um, last time I dragged him onto a stage in Toronto, he jumped up and he had secretly loaded slides on the projector and said, I don't want to just, I got to get my slides. And his slides are fascinating. So thanks they for bringing are. it up. Now talk to me about the eyes because my son, when, when he came home for his first concussion, we literally spent, you know, weeks in a dark room and yeah. he was fine until he started to read. And then he got these terrible headaches. So he stayed home for four more months. Yeah. Now I realize it was a vestibular issue, but in 2008, that wasn't even mentioned. Yeah, yeah, vestibular and visual for sure. Um, the couple of things we always like to tell visual, our- visual. Yeah, yeah, no, no. What we always like to tell our patients in the office is that actually, you know, those two systems, even though they're different, they're linked. And so basically the vestibular system, it manages your ability to handle motion um, and your visual system, you know, does a lot of different functions in particular, many of them are binocular and tracking in nature. And so again, um, I think it, is, it ends up being one of those things where um, for so long, we just kind of reduce visual function to simply visual acuity. So we basically figure if if you're 2020, you're good to go um, without remembering um, that basically there are a lot of things about visual function that are really like a very finely tuned, um, you know, engineering marvel, right? It would be very difficult for an engineer to design a robot to do visual tracking as well as our eyes do it on a normal day to day basis. Um, and we take it for granted. And once that um, uh, whole system gets injured, even in a concussion setting where it's a mild traumatic brain injury, um, even mild perturbations of that system can really affect function. Um, and then that function as it um, is, you know, um, decreased will affect symptoms. And then you have a whole snowball effect from there. And so really what it came from was listening to our kids, you know, that when our kids were telling us they couldn't really focus or see, and we would say, well, you know, you're 2020, or, you know, we would have, you know, advanced, you know, um, advanced trained, you know, neuro ophthalmologists examine their retinas, you know, they were fine. Um, what we realized was that it, it was about visual function, that they couldn't, to actually focus at a near distance, adjust from near to far, um, read, you know, um, attract uh, moving objects, or even um, read um, static objects, you know, on a page from left to right, because of the importance of that coordination being now injured after a concussion. And that's one of the things that if you, you know, if you're going to mimic, oh, the athlete has a, 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 this person has a concussion, what are you going to do? People like, oh, you pass you know, in front of their eyes. So I think there's some part of us that always have known that it involved eyes yep. because yep. you're supposed to look for some kind of tracking thing. And I've seen absolutely. coaches do that, that had no idea what they were looking for, but they were just doing it anyway. Yeah, now, absolutely. It, can you talk about the technology? Because I know that when you're looking for staccados and you're looking for those things, you are testing and also analyzing the data. And I know that you have technology now that takes it to the next level. Yeah, so I think from that standpoint, what we were observing was the fact that, it, you know, again, on a standard visual acuity exam where you're checking to see if they're 2020, you don't actually get any tracking, right? That's a static measurement. There's no dynamic measurement or assessment of eye movement. So the next step really was a clinical exam that involved um, examining and assessing eye movements. And so that's exactly what you describe. And many people will have seen coaches or athletic trainers or um, potentially even their physicians, you know, um, in the office doing these clinical assessments, trying to assess dynamic visual function that involves movement. Um, and then other assessments that we'll do will involve both single and um, uh, both um, eyes focusing, um, whether it's accommodation or convergence, which is both eyes focusing together. That's near to far. Like, near to okay. far, exactly. And you can see how this starts to capture a little bit of that dynamic aspect of what real visual function is like, you know, looking side to side, looking near to far and going back and forth very quickly. Um, and so then our interest really was, you know, we live in a technology um, saturated age where, you know, you have to say there's got to be some technology out there that someone has developed that will be able to assess this in a more quantitative and objective way. And so we've been interested in a number of things, including infrared eye tracking and pupillometry, among others. And so um, early on, we started uh, working with um, Uzma Samadani, who is now out at University of Minnesota, when she had a really novel concept with regard to um, looking at infrared eye tracking. Um, and that 
that has since uh, spun off in a company um, that we continue to work with, um, Archaeologica. Uh, we don't have any financial relationship with them, but we have been interested in um, doing research with their, with their device. And um, they did achieve FDA um, uh, approval for an indication in concussion a few years ago uh, with that. Um, but again, our, our main interest has been trying to better understand and quantify these deficits. Um, similarly, in the same way, you know, the eyes besides motion um, are an ability to look at the autonomic nervous system, right? Which is basically your nervous system that automatically adjusts things without you thinking about it. So whether it's your pupils adjusting to light and dark automatically, like a camera shutter, or if it's your autonomic nervous system helping you adjust your blood pressure when you stand up from sitting so you don't pass out, um, those are all um, functions that your autonomic nervous system does. And we've been interested in looking at pupillometry too. And so that was our most recent publication was on pupillometry and looking at that visual function, how that might um, contribute to visual issues after concussion. And then, I, and then I wanted to ask, does any of the technology, uh, well, first, are there, do, are, did you see any sex differences in the um, visual studies? Yeah, so right now we have not seen any in the eye tracking, um, but that is something that probably um, we need to actually um, collect more data in terms of numbers and analyze them along those lines. Um, but in the analyses to date, we hadn't seen any with the eye tracking. Um, with regard to pupillometry, we actually did see a little bit of a hint of that in terms of actually our healthy controls in that our healthy controls who had a history of concussion um, looked like they were trending towards having a little bit longer late and see in, ter in terms of the time from when they were exposed to the pupillometry light um, stimulus to how quickly their pupils reacted to that light stimulus and then um, uh, redilated after that light stimulus. So there was a hint of that actually in kids, um, girls in particular, who had a history of concussion, which had not been reported before. So that may be interesting to follow up. It's very, that was very preliminary. It's in our publication that came out this fall in JAMA Ophthalmology, um, but we definitely need to do more along those lines because in general, there have not been reported differences um, even by others with regard to um, pupil function um, but we were seeing a hint of that in our study that had um, 200 plus kids in it. So we'll have to investigate further. Um, the questions are fascinating. I'm going to save some of them, but do we have efficiency data for visual treatment? And I know for, um, you know, eye, eye therapy, uh, I think from what I understand was promoted for too many things that actually it didn't exactly produce the results promised pre you know all the concussion stuff but in concussion people have had some success with eye therapy how have you found um, the treatment side of working on some of these eye issues yeah, absolutely. I think that from that standpoint, um, you and the person asking the question is 100% on the money in that we definitely still have a lot of work to do to actually conduct those randomized clinical trials for vision therapy for conversions insufficiency after concussion. Um, just to throw out there though, um, um, Dr. Mitchell Scheinman is at the Eye Institute at Salus University here in Philadelphia. So we're very lucky to have essentially a world expert here in our town that we collaborate with on conversions insufficiency. And he and his colleagues conducted in the 2000 2000s and 2010s, um, you know, the definitive studies that showed that vision therapy did work for convergence insufficiency that was developmental in nature. Um, and so again, we would have to replicate that in concussion, but um, there is the evidence that it does support, um, you know, uh, use of vision uh, therapy for convergence insufficiency. And that work was funded by the National Institutes of Health and their National Eye Institute. So it was very rigorously conducted um, research. Um, the reason why we adopted that was that we found um, convergence and sufficiency in our patients. And so in the same way that we use vestibular therapy um, in concussion, and it's not like a special concussion vestibular therapy that we do. We do vestibular therapy for concussion because it appears that the vestibular system is injured when we actually look to assess it. And so that's how we use that in the same way that we would use vision therapy for convergence and sufficiency that we found after concussion. Um, yes, it's after concussion. We need to learn more about that scientifically speaking, um, but nonetheless, it is convergence and sufficiency. And so vision therapy should help. And we do use it in a subset of our kids, the ones that continue to have persisting issues and uh, turn out to have um, convergence insufficiency. And it's been very, very successful in the patients that we've used it in. It's really interesting. And I mean, Chris Gies is always one in his talks to say, you know, we don't come into concussion as a black box. We come mm -hmm. in with strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, and generally what I, you know, just from the families I've dealt with, you know, when it 
comes and it's a visual issue, they're like, oh, well, he had a convergence issue before we thought we fixed it, we'll go back to that doctor. And the, so it seems like we, you know, we do bring things to concussion and that it may amplify um, things that we've already recovered from or still are prevalent in our day to day, whether it's motion sickness or convergence, um, headaches, it seems, to, you know, can make what you already bring to it worse. Yeah. So again, I would say that's absolutely the case. And that's why a really thorough targeted history, looking at all those systems is very important. But then I would also say it's not a hundred percent guarantee that it's going to get worse. So again, our genetics is not our destiny. And I think right, at right. that same point, um, that is something that we talk a lot about in terms of with our kids who have, for instance, pre-existing anxiety or depression. You might worry that everyone that has pre-existing anxiety or depression would have that become worse after concussion. It's not always the case. And actually, it's interesting. I do think that our kids who are really, you know, well plugged in and are in therapy and have developed some really good coping skills for their anxiety and depression actually do better than some of our kids who've never had to deal with anxiety and depression before, have never developed those skills, and all of a sudden are hit with that um, after the injury. And so I think from that standpoint. Um, really important to think about both of those things. We don't come into concussion with a blank slate, um, but that um, you know slate that we come with doesn't necessarily completely um, determine what our outcome is going to be. And we just have to take what we uh, get and what happens with the injury and really just make sure we're paying attention to all those aspects and really address them no matter what they are. And that's one of the things I try to say to parents is that as a parent with a, going with a child growing up, at some point, middle school, high school, or college, your child is going to face a significant either health issue or mental health yeah. issue of some type. Yeah. And this is your opportunity to role play, yes. to lead, to show how you deal with adversarial conditions. And, yeah. you know, if you're a junior yeah. in high school, hey, this could be your college essay, you know, to try to say, you know, we all have mm -hmm. to do with things. And I think initially what I found in the support group, um, one of our groups is about 3,500 women that wow. when COVID first hit, Mm -hmm. And people were going into quarantine and completely yeah. freaking out on how one would exist. The, our support group was kind of like, uh, yeah, we, we've been, yeah. we, you know, yeah. we've been home, we get this, you know, and um, we're a virtual organization. So mm -hmm. we didn't have to pivot because we don't have a building to worry about. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, you know, how has COVID changed? And I can't believe we're already 32 minutes in. So we have to, I wanted to give you a couple minutes to talk how COVID has changed your clinic and changed your day to day. And then anything you want to uh, uh, add. And then about at 35, we'll go to the, some of the questions in the chat box. Yeah, sounds great. No, I mean, obviously COVID has really turned everything a little bit upside down for everybody. Um, one of the silver linings is that we really did ramp up the whole aspect of telemedicine. Um, you know, it's not optimal for, you know, assessments, but it is possible. And so that's good to know that there's that aspect. Um, you Are know, you doing those for initial ones? Like, can you do, you know, the when, entire thing on telemed or do you need when to we see were them? Yeah. When we were completely shut down in March and April, we were. Um, right now, that is not what we're doing because we do feel that the in-person evaluation is so important. Um, and so really we're trying to reserve um, the telemedicine to essentially um, engage our families um, more frequently than we might otherwise, right? And so um, when we were completely shut down, we were definitely having them um, uh, over uh, telemedicine in terms of evaluation. And we could manage and it was you know, suboptimal, but doable. Um, in terms of follow-up, um, they're doable as well. In terms of clearance, you know, one of the issues during the complete shutdown was that most kids were not returning back to organized official risk activities like tackle football. So, you know, again, we could return them to physical activity and all kinds of high levels of physical activity, um, you know, even with um, remote assessments, but we did want to see them back in person for clearance as well. Now that we're open back up, we're trying to use telemedicine as a way to really engage patients and families that normally part of the problem that we have is that we don't have the capacity to see everybody every week. Um, we can see our kids a little bit more frequently when we have telemedicine as an option. And so we have used that and sprinkled that into the mix. And so that's one way in which I would say COVID has given us a little bit of a silver lining with concussion. Um, but again, obviously we're all looking forward to coming out the other end of this thing. And is there anything else you'd like to say that you didn't get to say or anything about? You've got so many fabulous, so many fabulous research projects. We could we could speak for hours, but is there anything else you want to say to the, the group we have? We had 
up to 94 people again. So that was incredible. Thank you for everyone checking in. Yeah, no, this has been awesome, Catherine. No, I really, I think I've gotten all of our main messages out there, which is that, you know, de definitely when it comes to girls in concussion, you know, there are definitely differences, um, but those differences do not always have to be negative um, and they actually may have some positives. And there's ways in which if we can actually look at how we structure, you know, our research and also structure our medical care, potentially improve outcomes for girls. Um, and I think that early attention, early care is going to be a real important part of that. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that support groups. Um, I know that um, we've had so many amazing interns that have come on that have been um, recovering from a concussion. And I just think, you know, when you get to bond with other people that go through the same experience and then get to I mean, what we call being on the other side, yes. um, where you can look back at the experience. So um, we can open it up now to questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, if you want to um, unmute yourself, and um, ask a question, I'll stop talking. Um, Catherine, hi, it's Charlene. I have a question for um, our guest. <clears throat> Are you aware or, or have you used in your center the protocol of the blood test from Banyan biomarkers? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we have had a study that was ongoing in the emergency room for that um, Banyan um, panel, but right mm -hmm. now in terms of clinical use, um, we aren't using it simply because it's not FDA approved for under 18. All the original data and the research for the approval back a couple of years ago was in over 18. Um, they were conducting um, you know, research in that in kids and CHOP was one of the sites for that. Um, and, it, and it looks very promising, but it um, hasn't gotten FDA approval yet for clinical use in under 18 yet. Okay, great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say hello, um, Dr. Masters. It's Lynn How are Becker. You, Becker, great to I'm, see you. I saw you there. I like. I didn't even know it was you. I just have to tell everybody here, <laughs> Dr. Masters is amazing. And I traveled from Charleston, South Carolina with my daughter. She was the only neurologist who really, really genuinely diagnosed her correctly. And it, it was a, it was a hurdle, right? I mean, um, but you know, we speak so highly of you and fondly of you, and I am pleasantly surprised. I didn't know you were the guest speaker today. I, uh, I just, I launched my company because of everything that we went through, and everybody, do not hesitate to go see her. I can't oh. speak enough about her. You're so sweet, Mrs. Becker. <laughs> <laughs> but you're great. And so I just wanted to say hi. I got to tell Natalie I saw you I was today. Say, say hi to Natalie for me. I yeah, will. No. I will. But just for full disclosure, Mrs. Becker promoted me. I'm not a neurologist. I'm a pediatric sports medicine specialist. Oh, so sorry, sorry. Promotion, <laughs> which is great, you know, but yeah, I don't want to, I do not want to like, you know, go under false pretenses, but um, sorry. Oh no, don't apologize. It would be a huge honor to be considered a neurologist, right? So, uh, She's everything. Okay. <laughs> I had a quick question. I'm coming in, in a little bit late. Uh, Ms. Masters is uh, my daughter plays soccer and has spoken to some of the, uh, some of the professionals previously many, many years ago who had so much uh, post concussion syndrome mm -hmm. issues that were continuing and in the high school, we've noticed a number of, in at least private schools, the girls getting these concussions and your whole conversation is when to go back, et cetera. But is there a thought, a recommendation from your perspective that maybe we don't have headers, for example, until a certain age or after high school that is recommended in your, your expertise? Yeah, that's a great question. And we probably have insufficient science to support a specific recommendation. Um, what ended up happening with US soccer was it was litigation that actually prompted the change for them to raise it to above 12. 
Um, you know, again, I think that's very reasonable. If you talk to any, um, you know, folks who do soccer training for young people, um, most would agree that heading is a later skill. Um, it's not the primary skill that you're trying to have them work on. And it's very reasonable for them to be working on foot skills, um, footwork, uh, using the body to bring the ball down um, before they go to heading. And then when you go to train them for heading, again, there's a lot about proper technique and core strength and developing that um, and starting with a smaller, um, you know, softer, potentially even beach ball type of, um, you know, uh, equipment in terms of teaching that whole, um, you know, mechanism of heading. And so I think from that standpoint, we have to take into account both for sort of the developmental issues as well as the injury issues. And, and again, we don't really have the science that will 100% support one age versus another. Um, I don't know that anyone is saying we need to, to delay it um, or ban it in term entirely. Um, but I think from that standpoint, um, again, trying to reduce the risk of injury um, and unnecessary injury is really the issue. Um, so I think right now where it stands at 12 seems very reasonable. Um, you know, raising it to 14, you know, again, we'll probably take some other um, you know, either more data, hopefully, and that'll be data driven, um, or some other, you know, a particular, you know, force, you know, external or internal um, to drive that. Um, what age do you see? I mean, I know my 23 year old is still going to our pediatrician because they've been together since he was two and the, the pediatric office said, you know, he really needs to find an internist, but how, at what age do they have to leave you? Yeah, so it's interesting because actually um, at CHOP, it actually varies by the de department and the division. Um, so in my general pediatric practice, it's 18. Uh, but in my sports practice in orthopedics, we actually go through college with our kids. It's precisely for that reason that we see a lot of our college athletes through till 23. And actually, if you look at the World Health Organization, their definition of um, adolescence goes up to 23. And so I think from that standpoint, um, there can be you know, different costs for different groups, but ours will go up till 23. And then I want to know if you, uh, uh, there's some questions about um, the high and low hormone phase, Anna Maria, and I can never say that word, Anna Maria, can't say that word, but um, do you guys do any hormone testing or do you include a gynecologist if you have somebody who has had a concussion and either had um, very strong periods after or have lost their period? Absolutely. And so this is definitely something where, again, you have to ask the questions to be able to get the answers then to be able to make interventions that are, you know, uh, specifically um, targeted to your patient and personalized for your patient. Um, not every girl has disruption of her period afterwards, um, but there are many who do. And again, um, lots of work that is emerging now with regard to that in terms of you know, when you're injured in your cycle, how does that affect recovery? Um, can you develop amenorrhea or other problems? Um, is the hypothalamic pituitary axis affected, adrenal axis affected? Um, and certainly from that standpoint, it's not in everybody, but it may be in some, and it may be more than some. And so it's really important to ask on history um, um, and do the exam. And in some of our uh, cases with our patients, we do involve our endocrinologists. And so um, that would be um, absolutely very reasonable um, if your history and physical um, would point you in that direction, especially for a girl who's presenting with these issues. And not to promote the magazine again, but we have an article, adolescent females more likely to be diagnosed with an endocrine di disorder after TBI by Bruce Ortez. So that's also in the article. And Tina's article um, is in here with Natasha. And I just really want to thank you. Um, we do need to, last week I ran over a little bit, but I've been uh, roll, pulled in a little bit to be on time. But I really want to thank you and thank everybody for checking in that so many of you took out time on the beautiful afternoon to be with us. Um, do you have any, anything else you'd like to say, Tina, before we say goodbye? No, I just thank you so much, Catherine, for having me and for um, the North American Brain Injury Society for having this publication and having Catherine ed, um, be the editor of it. And it's so great to see such a wonderful community. I think that's really critical to moving this whole field forward. And we really couldn't do it without our kids and our patients without all of you. So um, we're really excited to be a part of this community. So thanks for um, having this time with me. Thank you so much. And I look forward to, is CHOP having a conference next year? So again, that's all up in the air with all the things going on with COVID, but we'll certainly let you know if we do.
Okay. They're great conferences. They really are. And so thank you for the time and thank you for contributing to the issue. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, next week, we're going to go up to Canada and see what's going on in Canada and hear about some great research up there. There's a lot that, as with the hockey people know, there's a lot going on in Canada. So thank you very much and everyone stay safe. And thank you again, Tina. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.